as you, as you stand on your feet and prepare your heart to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, I'm probably not going to get finished. <laughs> so this is, this is likely to be a series, okay? It's likely to be a series, and I'm entitling the series, Worship in the Wilderness. Worship in the Wilderness. Any, any, anybody in here know how to worship? Anybody in here in a wilderness? <laughs> Generally, we put our worship in one place and our wilderness in the other. And we come to church or we get up early in the morning and we have a worship service and then we go into our wilderness and deal with it. But we're gonna talk about the collision between wilderness and worship and what happens when that erupts. Uh, I'm gonna go to Exodus chapter 14, verse nine through 14. And we're gonna have a conversation out of the word of God. Uh, if you were here last Sunday, when we celebrated our uh, anniversary, our 27th anniversary, The Spirit of the Lord was thick in here. The, the glory of the Lord was thick in here and it was powerful. And then I began to vision cast for where I think the church ought to be going. And, and true to form, I am starting in that direction today. There were many uh, tenants that I talked about that were relevant to the vision of this church and where I see us going and, and how I believe we can get there. But one of the tenants was to cause you to have uh, encounters with God, real encounters with God. Now, that might sound redundant because a lot of you don't know the distinction between encounters with church and encounters with God. Some have encounters with talent. Some have encounters with personalities. Some people have an encounter with God. Uh, as, as many as, as uh, out of step as it was uh, when I came along, the old school where the, the church mothers would put you on the altar and have you tarrying for the Holy Ghost. Uh, as out of step as it might seem with today's trends, there is one thing that I noticed that once it really got in, I don't care where you went or where you tried to go or where you tried to run, it never fully came out. I'm, I'm getting a few amens because some of you are in here today because you had an encounter with God. Now, our churches didn't look so good. <laughs> they weren't so fancy, our pews weren't so comfortable, and, and our presentation wasn't so polished. But there was an explosive encounter with God that stayed down inside of us that tethered us to him in a very unique, powerful, and profound way that caused us to come to know him not just on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. We didn't come to church to get a little bit of Jesus. And we're living in an age now that people come in and they, 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 they use Jesus like oregano. They want a little sprinkle just a little sprinkle for decoration over the top of their lives. And so because we only get a sprinkle of Jesus and we don't really get an encounter with Jesus, we don't get along with his people. I'm gonna get into it. <laughs> we, we don't even get along with our own people. We don't get along with our own children. We don't get along with our own family. We don't get along with anybody. And I, I'm just gonna take you through a little bit of this. So y'all gonna go with me? Go to Exodus chapter 14, verse nine through 14. I welcome all of you that are online to have this experience with us. Prepare yourself for church unusual. Prepare yourself for us to break routines and rituals. Prepare yourselves for us to have an encounter with God. Oh my God. Yeah. 
you know that our church believes in therapy and we believe in counseling and we recognize the power of counseling. But a lot of things that we're trying to counsel need to be cast out. Uh, 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 <laughs> there is no replacement for therapy if you need it, but there's no replacement for spirituality working on your mind when your spirit is torn up. Come on, somebody. And so, so we, we got to take a, a deep dive and, and do what we do. Look at somebody and say, let's do what we do. So we're in the middle of, 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 of a transition. Oh gosh, I, I just, I'm scared of myself. We're, we're in the middle of a transition uh, in the text and we're in the middle of a transition in life. Uh, we have personal transitions like uh, transitioning from one age to the other, transitioning from one marital status to the other, transitioning from being a parent to an empty nester, transitioning from being a couple to having a baby. We're transitioning from one job to another, transitioning from one city to another. We're always in different states of transition. Coupled with the fact the world is in transition. The entire planet is in transition. Now, I don't know whether you're alert enough to notice it because most of us are so preoccupied with our personal transitions that we do not notice all of the empty uh, retail stores and commercial real estate. They're, they remind me of dinosaurs left behind. We don't pay any attention to the fact that these are buildings that have become not movements but monuments and a testimony to the fact that the ground has shifted up under our feet. And now you can get uh, a commercial property at reduced rates while residential property is skyrocketing because the way we do life, the way we do business, the way we do the world has changed so drastically that there are no absolutes. Your job is not solid. Your career is not solid. I hate to bring you this bad news, but it's true. They are inventing machines to do what you do, who can do them at faster rates or speeds than what you do. Uh, they took 20 of the best lawyers they could find to go through about 100 contracts to determine if there were anything wrong, if there was anything wrong with the contracts. They got 85% of it right, but it took them like two days to process all of it. The uh, chat GPT did it in 96 seconds. Now, common sense tells you if, if, if we can develop artificial intelligence that can speed up cures to cancer and leukemia and resolve contracts and do it at that speed and at that ratio, then the world is in the middle of a big shift. It's, it's a huge shift. All the experts are trying to figure out what to say because you're never as smart as you were 10 years ago. Because all of your information is based on the world as you knew it. But the world as you knew it is changing it. We grew up with Sears and Roebuck. We grew up with J.C. Penney's. Later in life, we went to shop at Christmas time at Toys R Us. Where are they now? These huge conglomerates that ran the country and ran the world and had huge employees and databases are all gone. They have been reduced to apps and been replaced by Amazon and other companies that have replaced them. And there are companies who are fighting for their life to stay relevant. Used to be you go in a FedEx warehouse, there were all kinds of uh, trucks moving and there were all kinds of people moving around uh, uh, with forklifts and all of that sort of thing. A friend of mine took a picture of a FedEx warehouse and sent it to me. I expected to see forklifts. I expected to see people. I expected to see people in uniforms. I expected to see union signs. No union signs, no uniforms, no people, all robots. All those jobs are gone. Goldman and Sachs has pre predicted that over 300 million people across the world globally will lose their jobs in the next 10 years. We are in transition. 
the world is changing. We are in transition spiritually. The witches now have more influence than the preachers. You, you can burn sage in your house, but don't wear a cross to work. Come on, talk to me, somebody. What used to be wrong is now right, and what used to be right is now wrong. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You are forbidden to say anything about any group that might offend anybody, and you end up offending everybody, and everything is controversial, and it has leaked into the church, and it has leaked into our marriages, and it has leaked into our homes. It used to be that when we married somebody, we were a team. Now we're a competitor. When did we get into this gender competitiveness where it's the women against the men? I posted a picture of a bunch of women working around the table and all the comments said, oh my God, look at how smart the women are. That's what I want to see is a room full of women, like we're at war with men. It's great to see the women standing shoulder to shoulder with men, but are we, are we trying to dominate each other, replace each other? Didn't God create us together and put us in the garden together and make us a team together so that we would complement each other and not compete with each other? What has happened to our society? And it's not just in the world, it's in the church. It's in the church, it's in the kingdom, it's in your house. Now we're having debates between boomers and millennials, between millennials and Gen X's, and it's the Bible fulfilling itself that fathers are against sons and son, daughters are against mothers. Generational fights are breaking out all over the world, and we're in transition. And so were they in my text. <laughs> so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pi, Hohirath, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt? Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Why, why, why are you bringing us out of what we were into? How dare you? Let's pick where we die. That's what this discussion is about. Are there no graves in Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Well, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Listen to the way they think. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. And you And you, and you, this is, what, this is your job, this is your job, this is your assignment. You shall hold your peace. Look at somebody very politely and say, shut up. Very politely. I don't know if there's a polite way to say shut up, but maybe be quiet.
My subject, my question, my thesis, my approach to this text is not the normal approach. The normal approach uh, to this text is the enemies that you see today, you will see them no more. And if we were interested, if we were preaching for reaction, that's an easy way to get there. But I am stuck at a much more complicated place. My title is, Are There No Graves in Egypt? Are there no graves in Egypt? Let's pray. Spirit of the living God falls fresh on us as we open up the Word of God today. I pray that this would speak to us in very deep places, that we would begin to recognize how often we resist better, because better is complicated, because better is frightening, because it's difficult, because it's more work. And, and we argue against those that would take us higher, preferring to go back to the familiar, even if it's slavery. I pray that you would speak to us in a profound and prolific way, and that our lives would be changed by this word, that our very living would be changed, not just this moment, not just this service, not just that we'd have a high hope, big time, and everybody would run the house, but that our lives would be changed by having an encounter with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Yeah, I'm gonna disrupt this place. The whole purpose of the saga of Exodus is built around the, the birth of the Old Testament church. Birth and death are always synonymous. Anytime something is born, something has to die. It has to die in its original form that it might be reborn in another form. And so the whole notion of Exodus is centered around the Old Testament ecclesia, called out church. They were called out. Moses' name means drawn out. And so life is a perpetual state of evolutions, of births and deaths, of being reborn, of being redeveloped, of it in one person's life. There, there are at least 10 of you. You're not the seven-year-old you were. Your idealistic perceptions have all been altered. You're not the 20-year-old you were. Your, your, your optimistic view of how you were gonna do this or that or the other has been altered or changed. Every year, every situation, every circumstance, every birth, every death gives you another little grain of wisdom that, that, be, that becomes a block that builds the framework and the substratum of who you are. We see God inviting his estranged children to be emancipated, not only to receive the, not only to relieve the oppression but to meet them in the wilderness to worship him. I want you to understand that they had not had a conversation with God for 400 years. They are the people of God. They are born to be with God, but they have not had a real relationship with God for 400 years, in part because of their association and in some ways assimilation with Egypt. Their association and assimilation with Egypt started out as a blessing and ended up as a curse. Okay, started out a blessing because there was a famine back in Israel and, and, and Jacob moves toward his family, toward where Joseph already was in Egypt, that they might get corn to withstand the famine. Everything that starts out a blessing doesn't end up a blessing. So the first 30 years or so, it was a blessing and it was a wonderful thing. But when the Pharaoh died, there was a Pharaoh who died that did not know Joseph nor regard his God. From that point, they became enslaved and they entered into 400 years of slavery. Watch this closely, but God knew it. Not only did God know it, God arranged it. 
Not only did God arrange it, God prophesied to Abram that this was going to happen. He said, your seed is going to sojourn in Egypt for 400 years. And afterward, they will come out with great substance. There is an expiration date on trouble. If there's a date you go in, there's a date you come out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They were not there because they were subservient or less qualified or less capable or less brilliant than the Egyptians. They were there by a divine prophecy whereby God incubated Abram's seed from a family into a nation. And in order to incubate the greatness that was in them, he put pressure upon them, but they were no less than the Egyptians, but they were forced to serve the Egyptians for 400 years. Now, psychologists teach that when somebody is abducted, they have a tendency to fall in love with their abductor. I don't understand that, but somewhere along the way, they have a love-hate relationship with the abuser. It, it might be involved also in domestic violence, a love-hate relationship with abuse, a love-hate relationship. Moses has come to emancipate them from 400 years of, of, of being contorted into whatever Egypt wanted. And anytime you contort who you are into what other people want, there comes a point where you become unfamiliar with who you really are. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've shifted everything about yourself to contort around what somebody demanded of you, and then something happened, they left, they changed, they died, and you're standing there trying to figure out who am I outside of what you needed me to be. So these are a people who have no sense of real identity. They have no sense of real understanding of their language. Their food is gone. Their cuisine is gone. Their uniqueness is gone. Their religion has been aborted. They have assimilated to the environment that they're in for survival. Survival necessitates sometimes that you adapt and adopt to situations that you didn't prefer because it is necessary in order to survive. And our Creator so endowed us with the ability to adapt that no matter what climate we're in, we physically adapt. No matter what situation we're in, we emotionally adapt. No matter what circumstances we engage in, we, we adapt to that environment for survival state because we have a strong survival instinct. We have a strong survival instinct. You wouldn't be sitting here today if you didn't have a strong survival instinct. Your heart has been broken. Your life has been altered. You've been disappointed. You didn't get everything that you wanted. Everything didn't turn out like you wanted it to turn out. But once you were in the situation, you adapted to the situation, found a way to cope with the situation, survived through the situation, and you ought to give yourself, even if you're not going forward, you ought to give yourself a hand clap that you didn't go back. Their poverty exceeds income and is an all-encompassing barren blight that has been comprehensively damaging and diversely documented. They've lost everything. They've lost everything. They have left Egypt to rediscover themselves by reconnecting with God. Watch this closely. They have left Egypt to rediscover themselves by reconnecting with God. You will never find you without Him. You will never find yourself, your identity, get your self-esteem back without Him. This is why they got out in the middle of the wilderness and started asking for the leeks and onions of Egypt because their taste buds 
had become like the Egyptians. This is why they built an image of God that looked like the Egyptian God because their concept of who God was is influenced by Egypt. This is why you come to church and, and start talking about a higher power because you are adopting the language of the people you work with. The man upstairs. I, I'm not a Christian, I'm spiritual. This, this kind of language is where you have lost your language that God gave you and adapted the language of the people around you in part because of your need to fit in. Your need to be connected, your need to be fresh, your need to be accepted, your need to be accepted by other people, other employers, uh, other CEOs, other companies, other entrepreneurs, other women, other men, have forced you to shape your personality into something that they applaud you for. And they don't applaud you for being who you are, they applaud you from being contorted into an image that reflects the times that we're living in. And so they'll tell you, oh, you're out of style. That's out of date. That's old school. So in other words, you got to contort back because now the style has changed. I'm sick of style. I'm sick of style. I do me. I wore something the other day. They said that's out of style. No, it's not out of style because it's in my closet. Out of style will leave you broke trying to keep up with what's in style. That's why they keep changing the style every week to make you have to go buy again so you can fit in again. Rather than investing your money, you are breaking yourself trying to keep up with something that somebody dictated out of Paris that you don't even know and you ain't gonna never be on a runway, but you're gonna be homeless in a shelter if you don't wake up and recognize Too much of our energy is spent trying to reconcile with men. We're trying to reconcile with men. We're trying to be in with people. We're trying to be in vogue. We want to be in shape. We want to develop the right language that gets us ahead, that gets us applauded, that gets people to clap for us. We're ashamed to say things that we used to be proud of. Things like, I love my wife. I care about my family. I take care of my husband. I make sure that he's good. Those, those kind of, I, I dare you to make a post about it right now and watch how many people attack you. It's, it's not that they're wrong to be them, it's that they want you to act like them or something is wrong with you if your values are not in the same place their values are. And so the fight goes on. It's a fight with men, it's a fight with women, it's a fight with generations, it's a fight with denominations, it's a fight with ethnicities. We're having war, 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 war. And I'm tired. Anybody tired? Anybody tired? of twisting and turning and reshaping yourself into all kinds of configurations, and by the time you get it all worked out, the style has changed. We don't do that over here. We don't do that over there. We don't do this over here. We don't wear that over here. We wear that over here. We do this and that until you are afraid to be yourself because your need to fit in trumps your need to be who you are. And now you don't know who you are. And so you got to go back and hit reboot and go back to the manufacturer and go back to God and say, who did you create me to be? What did you have in mind for me? How have you designed my life? to function because I am so tired. I've been what my mama said. I've been what my daddy said. I've been what my friends said. I've been what my gang said. I've been so many different things. I've been what my denomination said. I've been what the board said. I did what the school said. I did what everybody said to promote me to get to the next level and now I just don't even know who I am. I speak a little bit of Hebrew. I speak a lot of Egyptian. I got a little bit of Hebrew left in me but I got a whole lot of the Egyptians left 
left in me. And now here comes this joker trying to move me out from what I have adapted to. And even though I prayed that God would send a deliverer, when the answer came, I rejected what I prayed for. Come on, come on, I want you to see what I'm saying. I asked God to deliver me from this bondage. And now when God sends a deliverer, I'm fighting him tooth and nail and asking him, are there no graves in Egypt? You, we just left Egypt. If you wanted to stay in Egypt, you could have stayed in Egypt. But you got one foot in Egypt and you got one foot on the promises of God. And the moment you run into trouble, you revert back into what is familiar, even though it's not effective. And you're asking, are there no graves? And he didn't, by the way, what difference does it make where you die? Is death less deadly in Egypt than it is by the Red Sea? It's like during the AIDS epidemic, when it, I remember when it first came out, the, when you told somebody you had AIDS, the, first, the next question they asked you was, how did you get it? And I asked them, is there a good kind and a bad kind? <laughs> is, it, is it any less AIDS if you got it over here than if you got it over there? People ask stupid questions. AIDS is just AIDS. And I don't make any difference how I got it. If I got it, I just got it. Come on, somebody. The moment people got sick with COVID, the first thing they said to me, I don't know where I got it from. If you find out where you got it from, would that heal it? Are there no graves in Egypt? The same people who prayed to get out of Egypt are now praying, are, are now asking Moses, are there no, let me die a slave in Egypt serving Pharaoh. Reverse engineering your prayer because of your pain. You reverse engineer your prayer because of your pain. Let me go deeper. You reverse engineer your pain because of how much it costs you to get your promise. I didn't know it was going to be like this. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I, don't, I didn't know it was going to be. I didn't know it. So you want to go back? Now, listen, I know we're supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I know that Jesus prayed, yes, he prayed that we might be one. I get that. Yes, God wants us to leave our mother and father and take unto us a wife and become one flesh. Human unity is important, but our most important assignment is to be reconciled to God. You don't hear me yet. It is not my most important assignment to make it sure that you're reconciled to the potter's house. It is not my concern to make sure that you're reconciled to me. Because if you get cancer, I can pray for you, but I can't help you. If you get down, I can wish you well, but I can't lift you. The potter's house can't come get you. If all you are reconciled to is this, you will always be writing hashtag church hurt. There wouldn't be a hashtag church hurt if you weren't consoled to the church more than you were to God. I don't see anybody doing hashtag God hurt. But anytime you confuse God with church and you think that church is God and God is church, you're always going to walk away with a hashtag. Can I go deeper? Go to Luke 9, 49, 50. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him. Because he, because he followeth not with us. That's why we forbade him. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. 
For he that is not against us it's for us. In other words, don't expend energy trying to reconcile the church down the street. Anytime anybody builds a ministry around correcting everybody else. Anytime you are known by what you are against rather than what you are for, you cannot worship God and be the spiritual police over the world. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Can I show you another scripture right quick? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. Take a look at this. And all things are of God, and all, good God, Lord, stop. All, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. All things matter, material, stuff, all things are of God who have reconciled. So we can't worship things. We can't worship money. We can't worship being in the top percentile in the nation. We can't worship billion dollars, million dollars, trillion dollars. We can't worship at the shrine of things because all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. All God wants is to be reconciled with you. And he has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry and hath given us and hath given us the ministry and has given us the ministry and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I do not have the ministry of separation. I have the ministry of reconciliation. I will not aid and abet you in leaving. My job is all the way down to the end is to have the ministry of reconciliation. So if there's an argument, I'm not going to go to this side and get the scoop and then go back to this side and tell the scoop and then go back and say what you say so I can go back and tell them because I don't have the ministry of division. I have the ministry of reconciliation. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You have the ministry of reconciliation. If I'm stepping on your toes, I apologize, but they got to get hit today. You have the ministry of reconciliation. You can't help who breaks up. You can't help who falls out. You can't help who doesn't speak. But if you are aiding and abetting in the separation and the deterioration of anything that God put together, you are guilty. You have the ministry of reconciliation. I'm not saying there won't be people that get divorced. I'm, on, I'm not saying that there aren't people that you don't need boundaries of. I'm not saying that there, see, you got to spend a half hour on what I'm not saying so that I won't get as many tweets out there. I'm not saying that, there, that you need to be close to everybody, but it is not my job to help you hate somebody. It's my job to help you love somebody. I have the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know what would happen in this church if everybody in this church had the ministry of reconciliation? not the ministry of separation, but the ministry of reconciliation. If everybody started functioning in their gift, do you know what would happen in your family if you stop taking sides and operate in the ministry of reconciliation? Whenever you take sides, you've lost 50%. Why take sides when you can take over? Y'all didn't hear that. Y'all didn't hear that. Why take sides when you can take over? Whenever you take sides, you're down to 50%. But when you get the ministry of reconciliation, you can take over. You can take this 50 and this 50 and have 100 and put them together. Oh my God, I feel something about to happen in this place and I'm just getting started. You gotta have the ministry of reconciliation. Quit trying to break up your daughter with her husband. Yeah, and then coming in here speaking in tongues, you got to have the ministry of reconciliation. If she's not in danger, if her life is not threatened, if she's not fearing for her life, you shouldn't be on the other end pulling her, talking about he ain't nothing, he ain't nothing. Where's your husband?
We, we, we act like we're masterful at things that we are not masterful at. And we're giving out advice to people as if we have conquered in areas that we haven't conquered. And the truth of the matter is, misery enjoys company. So now you all can get together and talk about how bad men are. Or now you can get together and talk about how bad women are. So everybody wants you to be where they are so that you can make them feel comfortable. But if God hasn't told you to give up, fight for whatever it is or whoever it is that God has given you. You have the ministry of reconciliation. I'm going to go deeper. To wit that God was in Christ. To wit that God was in Christ. To wit that God was in Christ. There's no argument about it. To wit that God was in Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Reconciling the world unto himself. God was using Christ in him to draw them back to him, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I could stay there all day. <laughs> yeah, I, I could stay there all day because some of us are so busy trying to perfect ourselves that we don't propel ourselves. And, and we're trying to fix something that God is not imputing. I, I'm not going to go deeper than that. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So that means I got to stop telling people, you ought to come to my church. And you ought to start telling them, you ought to find my Jesus. And once you lead them to the Lord, then you ought to invite them to church. But stop bringing work in here for me to do when you've been talking to him for six weeks and you haven't brought up Jesus. And now I'm going to bring you to my pastor so you can find the Lord. They can find the Lord in Starbucks. They can find the Lord in the grocery store. They can find the Lord in a meat market. They can find the Lord anytime they find somebody who has the ministry of reconciliation. You don't need no papers. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a D -mid. All you need is a mouth. If you open up your mouth and start winning souls, people will come to Jesus. I am tired of a lazy church. We need to wake up the church. Shepherds don't begat sheep. Sheep begat sheep. Touch your neighbor and tell him I got to do something. <laughs> for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I hope I get to tie this into my next part. For he has made him to be sin for us. Talking about Jesus. He have, God has made Jesus to be sin for us. Do you understand how huge that is? God has made Jesus to be sin for us. Father, if it be thy will, pass this bitter cup from me. It's not about a cross. I don't want to take on the sins of the world. That is the horror of Calvary. It is not the physical debauchery of the nails. It is taking on that which God hates. Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't do it, but he took the crime. He, he paid the bill for it. He took the charges. He accepted the, 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 the charges of a sin he didn't commit. That we might be made the righteousness of, of God in him. Park right there for a minute. I want you to understand. Jesus is just as innocent as I am guilty. And yet the innocent paid the debt for the guilty 
so that the guilty could have the righteousness of the innocent. And just like he was judged for a crime that he didn't commit, I'm accepted with a righteousness that I could never earn. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I come boldly to the throne of grace. I, if I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace, I must be coming in the name of Jesus because I can't be coming in the name of Jake's. I have to be coming in the name of Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's what we got to go back to the gospel. We got to preach the gospel because time is winding up. We got to preach the gospel because the world is changing. We got to preach the gospel because this planet is getting hotter than it has been in thousands of years. And the gospel said that the works of the earth will burn with fervent heat. When I first read that scripture, that sounded ridiculous. But in these temperatures rising every day, I'm starting to see that the prophets from 2,000 years ago are prophesying a day that we are seeing today. Air conditioners are just quitting. Just say, I quit. I can't keep up with this heat. Prisoners are dying in prison. No air, no air conditioning, no ventilation in prison. The majority of prisons have no air conditioning. Can you imagine 115 degrees surrounded by concrete walls and no window? And our government is not interested in air conditioning the prison. In other words, they, they don't want to put you in prison. They want to cook you. And nobody seems to care about that. They don't deserve air conditioning. Well, just kill them in the first place. Why would you make people die? Right this week, people are dying in prison. Are there no graves in Egypt? While you sit in your air conditioned home, fanning yourself, I think it's roughly about 92% of American homes have air conditioning. Your cousins, your sons, your uncles are in prison cooking. Hashtag that. Thought all lives mattered. I'm just saying, <laughs> if all lives matter, <laughs> I'm just asking a question. If all lives matter, do their lives, that's somebody's baby, that's somebody's child, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's mama, that's somebody's son. I know they did wrong, or maybe they did wrong. You gonna cook them? Homeless people are burning up on the sidewalks. Can't find a place to lay their head. No headlines about that. But all lives matter. Really. Take the black and white out of it. Just life, period. You pro-life? I asked the question, are you pro-life? Stop cooking, people. Now, the text takes us to a place where there is a battle between gods. Can I go deeper? 
There is a battle between gods. There is Elohim, the God of the universe. And there is Pharaoh, who sees himself as God. Pharaoh thought he was a god. But God will remove anything and anyone who is standing in between us being reconciled to him. And it is the most dangerous thing you can do is to get in between me and God. If me and Sarah, stand up for a minute, Pastor Sarah, if me and Sarah get mad at each other, it would be smart not to get in it. Because whatever we arguing about, it ain't going to last long, and after a while, we're going to come back together, and both of us are going to jump on you. So, yes, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you what's going to happen. I'm telling you what's going to happen right now. It would be foolish for you to get in between us because the tie that binds us is bigger than the argument that divided us, and it's a temporary argument, and it's not going to last because love is going to win the fight. It would be foolish to get in between me and my wife. So don't come in the house and try to be a, 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 a broker, some kind of division between us because we might be mad as fire at each other when you came in the house. But before the week is over, you understand? Now, if you think that's bad to get in between me and Cor, how are you going to get in between me and me? Y'all understand that? That's just a metaphor. To get in between me and God when I was created in his likeness and created in his image, if you try to get in between me and God, Pharaoh, you're going down, bro. You're going down, dude. You're going down. 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 You're going down because you got in the way of me and God. Last Paul and Silas praying in the jailhouse at midnight. The jail was trying to stand in between Paul and Silas and God. God sent an earthquake, tore down the whole jail. If you start crying out to God, I don't care who your oppressor is, God will defeat your oppressor when you want to be connected with God. Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Woe be unto the man that's trying to stop your woman from going to church. You must want to die because if you get in between that woman and her God, I don't care how big you are. I don't care if you work out in the gym eight days a week. God will bring you down. You're a Pharaoh. Somebody give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. Crazy praise. I said crazy praise. I can't explain it, but he loves me. I can't explain it, but he's for me. I can't explain it, but he wants me. He literally moved heaven and earth to be with me. He came down through 42 generations to be with me. He wrapped himself in human flesh to be with me and called himself Emmanuel, tabernacled with us just so he could be with me. And even though you think I'm a funny looking, out of shape, no good old man, ain't good for nothing, he thinks I'm the apple of his eye, altogether lovely, full of truth and glory, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And if you get in between me and him, he will move you out.
sit down because I'm about to get fired up. And I'm not supposed to be fired up because I'm still in the opening. And I ain't got nowhere. And I know I'm not going to finish, but I do hope to get a little bit further than this. So I, I started on this hunt to try to figure out which Pharaoh is the Pharaoh that got the whipping. And some people said it was Ramesses the second, but other theologians disagree with that. Ramesses the uh, second lived from about 1300 BC to about 1213 BC. Uh, he, he is normally called Ramesses the Great. He was an Egyptian pharaoh that stood above all other Egyptian pharaohs. He was in a class all by himself. But he, he was the third ruler of the 19th dynasty. Along with Thutmose III of the 18th dynasty, he is often regarded as the greatest, most celebrated, and most powerful pharaoh of the New Kingdom, which itself was the most powerful period of ancient Egypt. So Egypt is not just a country like it is now, it was a superpower. It was, uh, I want that to sink in. It was the superpower. This is not just a bunch of men wearing funny hats. This is the superpower of its era. There, there was no Supreme Court. There was no jurisdictional court. There were no lawyers. There were no attorneys. There was nobody to plead your case. Whatever Pharaoh said, that's what it was. If he said cut her head off, it was off. If he said boil him in oil, he was fried. Pharaoh was the boss. That's why he thought himself to be God. There was no uh, system in place of checks and balances that diminished his power. And power corrupts. And total power totally corrupts. And he was in total power. I was in a country, I won't name the country, but it has a king and not, not a democracy, not a government, it has a king. And, and the king was nice to me, we had a great time, but I was sitting on the plane thinking to myself, if he says I can't fly out, I can't get out of here. He don't need a rule, he don't need a reason. He's a king. So you don't understand real power. Real power never has to explain itself. Real power just is. That's why your mama said, because I said so. <laughs> now you want to have a debate and a council meeting in the boardroom. When we grew up, it was because she said so. If you stay in here, that's how the sentence would start. If you're going to stay in here, if you don't want to sleep out there on the snowy back porch or find yourself a place to stay, I'm not advocating for it, I'm just explaining it. <laughs> Ramesses was often considered a possible Pharaoh during this period, in part due to the references in the Bible to him and the development of cities assigned to the growth of Egypt, of which the Hebrews were building. He built more, he did more. He had in place economic systems that survived more. He had an army to be revered. All of these are signs of a superpower, economic wealth, military power. He had both of them simultaneously. He had 600 chosen chariots. That wasn't the entire fleet. Those were just the chosen chariots out of the mass of fleets. So he, he, he releases the 600 chariots after a bunch of farmers. It's like dropping a nuclear bomb in the hood. The odds are totally stacked against them. And when they heard the hoof prints coming after them, they were afraid. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or oh, it could have been Akhenaten. He was the 10th ruler of the 18th dynasty. I don't know. The theologians don't know. I can't figure it out. I'm not gonna worry about it. But Akhenaten's reign is noteworthy for another reason. During this period, he was able to do some unique things. Egypt's polytheistic 
religious system was completely removed and replaced by an unprecedented turn toward monotheism. So that, that kind of tells me uh, that, that, that he, Akhenaten, is also being influenced by the Hebrews yes, who were monotheistic. Yes, One thing affects the other thing. I was teaching a master class day before yesterday in DC and I told them when Jesus said we are in the world but not of the world, I said imagine taking a glass Coke bottle, I know they don't make it much now, but a, a glass Coke bottle and putting it down in a pan of water. The Coke is in the water but it's not of the water. But it's affected by the water because when you start boiling the water, the glass is going to eventually shatter. So we, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And if the glass shatters, now the Coke is going to affect the water because the water affected the Coke. So we cannot be in the world with blinders on, not noticing what's going on around us. Because if the water boils, the glass shatters. So you can't just read your Bible. because you got to keep check on the temperature of the water. Even though you're not of it, you're in it. <laughs> you're in it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I can't galvanize in my own mind exactly which one it is, and it really doesn't matter. What is important is that Moses asked for the liberation of the Semites or Israelites or Hebrews, however you want to phrase it, all points to the same thing. Pharaoh's response was increased affliction. Can I go deeper? I want to go deeper. I've been getting ready for you. I've been getting ready for you. I'm loaded. I'm locked. I'm in place. I'm on fire. I'm ready to go. I got something to say. Now, Pharaoh is chasing them trying to get them back, it would appear. But I wonder if he wasn't trying to get the gross national product back because they had borrowed so much economic wealth that they survived 40 years in the desert and never went broke. That they had enough wealth that Moses was raising an offering and had to say, stop. I have never raised an offering Moses said, y'all giving so much, just stop. There's so much wealth left with the slaves when they were leaving Egypt that they had to put it on the backs of their children. Generational wealth. So even little Johnny had a bag of gold. Mary Sue had a bag of gold. And grandma had a, a bunch of bracelets and silver in her head. Everybody was dragging something out of Egypt. And they didn't steal it. The Bible says they borrowed it, but it was really due them because after 400 years of not getting paid, this is what reparations look like in the book of Exodus. They were dragging the wealth of 400 years of back pay. I don't know who this is for, but God's about to give you back pay. He's about... He's about to give you double for your trouble. He's about to restore unto you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust ate up. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to in here? All that stuff you did for people and they never paid you back. Every time you helped somebody and they forgot you. Every time you delivered somebody, encouraged somebody, and they stuck a knife in your back. Every time they borrowed money and never paid it back. You may not get it back from them, but God has sent it from somewhere. He'll give you houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't go. God's going to make sure you get it back because God is a just God. God is a just God. God ain't going to let me work that hard for you and not bless me somewhere. Y'all don't hear me. God is going to bless me. He's going to always bless me. He's always blessed me. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. All 
the blessed people, holler at your boy. My God, I feel like something's about to happen in this place. Something's about to happen in this place. You might want to stay in Egypt, but I don't. You might want to be buried in Egypt, but I don't. You might think your story ends as a slave, but I don't. You might think that you were just created to serve somebody else, but I don't. I believe I'm going to be the head and not the tail. I might start at the bottom, but I'm not going to stay at the bottom. Glory to God. I'm going to be like the Beverly Hillbillies. I'm going to move on up. Come on. I'm coming up a little higher. I'm loading up my truck. God's got something else for me. God didn't let me die in Egypt because God has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you're going to get to watch me eat before it's over. Oh, sit back and watch me, 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 watch me. I feel the Holy Ghost about to break loose in this place. I feel the anointing about to have a fit in this place. The glory of the Lord is about to break loose in this place. You're coming into an eating season. You've been through a weeping season. You've been through a working season. You've been through a waiting season. But now you're coming into an eating season. Somebody praise him for what you're about to devour. praise him for justice. If you didn't get it in your first relationship, you're going to get it in your next relationship. If you didn't get it in your first job, you're going to get it in your next job. If you didn't get it in this city, you're going to get it in that city. God has a table prepared for you. He didn't wait till you sat down to set the table. He set the table before you ever sat down. Surely, surely, surely. Ten people and tell him he's got something for me. He's got something for me. He's got something. He's got something for me. 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 Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. God's got something for me. God's got something for me. That's why the cancer didn't kill me. That's why the car wreck didn't destroy me. That's why the Pharaoh can't have me. God! 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 Oh. I feel a reckoning day coming. 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 Somebody thank the Lord right where you are. Touch your neighbor, touch your neighbor and tell him, put death on hold. Put death on hold. I ain't got time to die. I ain't got time. Not till I'm carrying out everything that God has for me. I cannot die until I cross this Red Sea. I cannot die till I get back everything that I invested in life. The devil is alive. Stop planning my funeral. God! 
God, our God, God is, he ain't through with me yet, he ain't through, he's not through with me yet, can I get a good hallelujah, can I get a good hallelujah, can I get a crazy praise of expectation in this house, make some noise if I'm preaching to you. I was reading, I didn't realize that Egypt had a northern region and a southern region. And the southern region was dominated by Semites, Hebrews. And they were growing in power and authority. And I can't understand why Pharaoh is trying to get them back because he said he said, they are growing in might and power. And he said, we have to do something. Let's deal wisely with them. Lest they overcome us. Anytime people hate you, it's because they're scared of you. They're scared that you overcome them. That Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I feel like preaching now. I, I, I feel like preaching now. Uh, you keep thinking there's something wrong with your hair. There's something wrong with your dress. Uh, there's something wrong with how you speak. No, they're scared of you because you are growing in power. And they see you growing when you don't see yourself growing. Uh, lay your hands on yourself and say, I'm growing. I'm a better woman. I'm a better man. I'm a bigger woman. I'm a bigger man. I'm a better preacher than I've ever been in my life. Cause I'm growing. You don't have to tell me I'm growing. I know when I'm growing. Can I get a good witness? Somebody that's been dwarfed all your life and you're starting to grow. Take 10 seconds and praise God. So you got one side growing rapidly because they are the seed of Abraham. They're growing so fast that Pharaoh is afraid of them. He's afraid of anarchy. So his adamant suppression and desire to kill the baby Moses and to make it hard for them by causing them to make bricks without straw is not because they are weak. It's because they're strong. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So he thought, I'm going to afflict them because I'm afraid of them. Anybody who's afflicting you, anybody who's afflicting you is afraid of you. The only problem was the curse didn't work because the Bible said the more they afflicted them, the more they afflicted them, the more they, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk to you folk that ain't been afflicted. I want to talk to a thousand people in this room that have been afflicted. Haven't you noticed the more they afflicted you, the more you grew. They meant it for evil, but God made it good. I decree and declare a boomerang blessing in this place. God is about to make it boomerang in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel a shout of victory in the middle of your dry place, in the middle of your desert, in the middle of your storm. Open up your mouth and holler.
It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. No devil in the hell can stop it. No downsides in the job can stop it. When God says I'm blessed, I'm blessed. I'll be blessed in the city. If you throw me in the field, I'll be blessed over there. If you let me in, I'll be blessed in. If you put me out, I'll be blessed out. Y'all don't hear me? I wish I had some blessed people in this room. I don't care what they put you in. You turned it into a blessing. Slap your neighbor and say boomerang. Back at you, devil. Back at you, devil. Back at you. Back at what you said. Back at what you did. Back at how you showed out. Back at you right now. I'm still blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You threw me in the pit. I still got blessed. You put me in part of his house. I still got blessed. You threw me in jail. I still got blessed. Somebody shout yes. the hand and stand on your feet. This is part one of worship in the wilderness. I don't care how good they smell. I don't care how nicely dressed they are. The person you touch it has been in a dry place. They've had their wildernesses. They've had their calamities. They've had their altercations. They've had their struggles. But squeeze them by the hand and let them know. I have the ministry of reconciliation. I'm coming to get you out. If I'm coming out, shake them real good. You got to come out with me. If I get blessed, you got to get blessed with me. If I'm an overcomer, you got to overcome with me. And I bind every devil, and I bind every devil that's trying to keep you in Edom. You will not die. You will not collapse. You will not faint. You will not give in. You will not die in Edom. Shake their hand like you lost your mind. You coming out today. You coming out today. You're coming out. Out, out, out. You're coming out today. Every demon, every devil, every witch, every spell has got to let you go. Now break loose and praise him like you're a loose man, like you're a loose woman, like you're a loose preacher, like you're a loose mama. Like you a loose daddy. I can't hear ya.
rights. Yes! Claim your privileges. Yes! Stand up like a grown woman and let hell know I'm not coming. I will not die where I suffered. I will not die in my trauma. I will not die in my pain. Shout yes! Story, what I didn't get to tell him is in the middle of all of this trouble and this attack, which I'll pick up next week, there was the greatest wealth transfer. In the history of the Old Testament, Pharaoh was trying to get his stuff back. There was a massive wealth transfer. Too much for the grown people to carry. The kids had to carry it. Grandpa had to carry it. The slaves had the goal of the masters. There is no other explainable reason why Pharaoh would use 600 chosen chariots to get back people he was trying to get to go, to get back people who he was afraid of, lest they outgrow us. He should have been glad they were gone. Then why was he mad? It was because there was a download a supernatural download of increase to establish them as a superpower. I'm telling you right where you stand, there's going to be a shift. And you got to put yourself in a position, in a position I don't care how much food God has prepared at the table for me, if I don't get in a position where I can consume what he has. Yes, things are going crazy. Yes, the weather is going crazy. The climate is going crazy. The government is going crazy. Politics is going crazy. Businesses are going crazy. Commercial products are going crazy. Industries are going through changes. But the more they afflicted them, the more they grew. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In the middle of the craziness, I haven't even got to talk about the 10 plagues yet, but I'm going to talk about all the plagues that fell on Egypt and all the diseases that came, and all the destruction and the pestilence, and the trouble with the animals, and the boils that broke out, and the water turned red, polluted with blood. In the middle of all of that pollution, same stuff we're seeing today, in the middle of all this chaos going on, there was the greatest wealth transfer, and the greatest spiritual liberation imaginable that came upon the people of God because God doesn't need you to get out of trouble to bless you. God is a present help in the time of trouble. What I'm preaching to, God is, God is, God is. The very strength of my life, he's a lifter up of my head. He establishes a way for me. He prepares a table before me. 
He guides me past my enemies. I don't know who I'm talking to. My job is to get you reconciled to God and to break this mindset where you want to die in Egypt in disease, in disgrace, in mediocrity, in depression. Just because you ran into trouble in front of you, you're going to want to go back to what God just brought you out of? When you come back next week, I'm going to go into this deeper. Somewhere in the journey, it ceased to be about who they were running from and who they were running to. Some of us are only in church because something drove us here. But that's not what God wants. God wants the splendor of his presence to be the object of your adoration. Not just belonging to a group, not just running from a Pharaoh and addiction and abuse, a trauma. So he drowned what they were running from. because he doesn't want you to come into his presence as a refugee. So he killed the one who made you run. So you could fall in love with the one. Who gave you life. And the Lord said to me, when I prayed about what the vision for the church was, one of the things he said to me, he said, I want you to teach and preach until they have an encounter with me, a real encounter, a real encounter with me. I know you used to going to church and you used to doing whatever you used to doing and you're used to doing this and that, God said, I'm sick of it. I want to envelop you. I want to engulf you. I want you to be the burning bush. I want you to be the bush I set on fire. I want to be in your Monday, in your Tuesday, in your Wednesday, in your Thursday, in your Friday. I want to engulf your decisions. I want to make big moves with you. I want to be the one you consult with before you make your next move. I don't want a bunch of church members. Church is good, it's important, it's necessary. But what God wants is for you to have an encounter with him that explodes in your life. And on the first deposit of this series, the only thing he asks you right now is to be hungry for him. Yes. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. He's not even talking to you about righteousness. He's not talking to you about righteousness. He's not talking to you about righteousness. He's talking about hunger. He's talking about want to. He's talking about you listening at your own life. Don't you hear your life send you the signals that something is missing? 